The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Designing Interactive Systems. We um, started a quick whirlwind tour of the history of HCI, which we will continue today and move on into sort of the um, future looking part, uh, look at some of the visions that people had in the past of how they thought HCI might turn out. Uh, those will be informative to judge where we're standing today and what kind of things have already become common sense and which things have turned out totally different. So um, a very quick review of last week's topics. Um, we talked about um, Jacob Nielsen's um, distinction or classification, if you want, into 0D, 1D, and um, two and a half D user interfaces. Um, does anybody remember what those different distinctions meant? Um, so the zero D interfaces were when there was no interaction at all. Uh, these were basically something like a batch processing system mm -hmm. where you would give all the computed code and then at once it would process everything and then the next day you would get the result. Uh, yep. The one D yep. systems were uh, kind of like command line interfaces, uh, not exactly a complete user interface. Uh, and I think the two point five D started with the Sketchpad and Apple II computers, where we saw the word processors and stuff, where the interaction was much more efficient. Uh, although um, I'm not sure if I'm defining it correctly. Mm. No, that's that's very close. Um, uh, we should say that even the 1D interface, the command line interface, as you said correctly, of course, that's, that is a UI, right? Um, it does exist and it works. It's just a different kind of interaction that is sort of um, on a string, if you want, right? You, you basically yeah. are sending a string of commands to the computer, the com computer sending back a string of, of commands or, or output back to you. Um, and that's what, what Nielsen referred to as a, as a 1D interface. Um, in between was the two, 2D interface, which we maybe didn't cover explicitly, but that is, of course, of course, is the moment that you can start to interact with the screen as a whole, right? Where you can go up, you know, back and forth. So, so literally have a 2D interaction possibility on the screen. So any full screen apps, you know, where you can move your cursor around, it doesn't have to be a graphical UI literally, um, but anything where you have a full screen interface would be 2D. Um, so where you can like step back up into your command history or, or rather like you've got your full screen text editor and you can move your cursor anywhere you want on the screen. Um, that was 2D and 2.5D was what they actually referred to or Nielsen referred to when he said through the graphical desktop metaphor, you've got the possibility to, you know, um, overlap windows, right? And, and while, um, you know, that's not really a 3D interface, it means that, you know, it's, it's kind of 2.5D because the stuff that's behind that layer is kind of hidden from you. You can't interact with it at this point. It's not really full 3D interface where you could like peek into that back window, but you know, you can switch orders of, of windows and therefore have sort of a stacked um, view of multiple 2D interfaces. All right, uh, then we talked about a couple of uh, key uh, systems, seminal systems that sort of broke new ground. Um, let's see, what kind of things were the key innovations in Sketchpad? Anything that, that Sketchpad did for the first time? Um, Marta, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I would say a light pen would be the innovative way of interacting with systems mm -hmm. and writing uh, and sketching uh, shapes and stuff. Yep, yep. So the light pen was actually, you know, the, the thesis con uh, contains an acute sort of construction uh, instructions for, for a light pen. And the, the light pen had been around as an input device before on those like specific um, radar systems, for example. But here it was used for the first time to really create um, graphical content, right? To sketch lines or mark dots on there. You couldn't like freehand do doodle on it yet. That was not the idea but you could provide points and those points be connected by lines or arcs, for example. So um, that was one thing. So, so this graphical interaction with the help of the light pen, right, is, is um, a first in there. Um, Fabian, what do you think? 
um, the way that like objects and lines worked on the screen and the constraints you can put on them so that they are all attached to one dot, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there were, it was not just a, um, a CAD program, which had not been seen until then, but it was actually a CAD program that immediately contained things like constraints, which is actually a pretty complex thing to do um, to, to apply to a graphical drawing. Um, exactly. And uh, it wasn't like just limited to 2D, you know, we could do 3D as well. Uh, we had, we, we saw things like um, reference to objects where you had like a master and then multiple um, copies of that master uh, piece and you could ch change one master object and all the copies would change automatically. Um, so there's a variety of things that were, were new in there. It was even, even the idea of um, writing code in a graphical way, right? You know, graphical structuring of a, a flowchart, for example. And don't forget the, you know, the interaction, while it wasn't, it wasn't new to have buttons, of course, they'd been around before, but there was an, an interesting mix between you know, moving things on the screen and turning a dial at the same time, a knob at the same time, giving you actually an interesting multimodal bimanual interaction technique um, that you don't have usually uh, when you interact with, with a graphical toolkit like Illustrator, for example, today. All right, moving on to NLS. What's the star of the NLS show? What were the key things that were new there? We're still in the in the sixties here. Come on, NLS. You and I, you happen to be on my screen here. Um, yeah. Okay. So I think he was the first one, or he present uh, presented uh, the mouse. Mm -hmm. But um, like an old-fashioned way, where the um, it was the other way around, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think it was the one he did. He use hypertext mm -hmm. also links. Yep, exactly. Yeah, um, actually, that's it. What I remember. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. So, so we've got the mouse, um, the the graphical editing that you know, moving around the text by pointing to things in the text. It wasn't yet a window based interface, at least not in the graphical sense that we knew, but um, it actually did introduce sort of the split screen view, you know, where I could click on a link up here and see the definition down there. Um, so hypertext was introduced, um, word processing, um, you know, structured folded editing of, of, of outliners, so outline editing. Um, um, two other things maybe that we, sh that we should mention here. Um, one had to do with another maybe bizarre input device that we actually saw later too. It, it, it stayed on for a little while before it went away. What were, what were people doing with the left hand? How about um, Jonas Lemon here? Jonas Lemon, calling Jonas Lemon. Okay, no answer from there, still asleep. Um, so let's see here. Anybody else has an idea on the other things that we're still missing? Uh, yes, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think the keyboard style uh, like input device was kind of new, like you could uh, use some chords to uh, input specific uh, combinations or even characters. Right, exactly. And this was mostly used for command input um, to provide things, you know, modifiers or to trigger commands. He, he used that a lot with his left hand when he was doing things like copy this block of text to somewhere else, right? He would trigger that command with a combination of fingers on his left hand, not touching the main keyboard at all, um, you know, the, the, the QWERTY keyboard. Um, and then he would use the mouse to point out which areas he wanted to be copied from where to where. So it was... Um, uh, quite a powerful uh, and fast system, but needed a lot of training because, you know, the visibility, of course, of a coding keyboard is very low, right? You don't see what, uh, what it offers. It's not labeled in any useful way because of the multi multiple fingers that you need to combine to use it for certain operations. Um, and then we had well, one thing that I thought was really impressive back for the time, um, reminding me of what we're doing here today. Yeah, Elena. 
they had like a, um, a conferencing tool with like video, uh, yeah, video conference. Yes, yes. And, and this was actually a, you know, kind of like an, an analog blend in of, a, of an analog TV link, really, right? So nothing like what we're doing here today. Um, but uh, it did offer the ability to actually collaborative, collaboratively edit text, right? Have two pointers move around, you know, on the same screen and, and point at different things and, and so on. So that was, I thought, pretty advanced if you think about it, having multiple pointers at the same time. Um, right, and then we have the alto and the star. Um, when I said, you know, the chord keyboard still showed up when you look at the, the, the picture, uh, pictures of the alto, for example, you can still see that um, device sitting there on the desk. Um, and I think also still with the star. Um, but the key innovations of the alto and star were something else. Because while we were seeing, um, you know, NLS using a mouse, um, yeah, Victor. Uh, there was a complete um, like new interface how like people can interact with the system, like this idea of Windows of different shortcuts. Uh, so they introduce all this folders type and so on. Yeah. So. The, the key thing here underlying all that is, is quite simply sort of this full bitmap display, right? So to actually have an ability of the user interface to, to individually address every single pixel. Um, and that led to the, the, the GUI, right? The graphical user interface that we're totally used to today, um, which then of course enable things like windows, icons, um, menu bars or menus in general um, we saw also uh, beyond that, um, you know, beyond that bitmap display and the GUI, we saw the desktop metaphor, as you said, you know, folders, etc., even a little trash can and things like that. Um, and then also um, in terms of text processing, we uh, saw the Alto and Star introducing things like um, uh, what you see is what you get editor, right? Very different from what you saw before in NLS, where you were still editing basically a, you know, um, mono spaced, um, you know, plain text file, right? Now you could actually look at a uh, text document on the screen and it looked like you would print it out, right? With all the uh, different styles applied and, and, and so on. So a very different idea. What you see is what you get. This WYSIWYG pr principle was a major change in you know, being able to preview on your computer directly what you were gonna create as printout. And remember this was done by Xerox. So they were all about, you know, the office of the future. So documents and, and printed pages and so on were still very much um, in, in, at the front of their mind. Right, so now um, very quickly uh, after that, I, I mentioned the, uh, the Lisa that came out in 1983 when, when, when Jobs was inspired by um, what he saw at Park. Um, and uh, we talked about some of the, the things here that were, were new. We see um, um, a mouse was being carried over. So that was being adopted. Um, we see also uh, a key advance that hadn't been around before, the, uh, the fixed menu bar um, that replaced the ideas that had been around on the Alto and the Star where things were more like pop-up menus that appear um, wherever you want them. And this is not only an improvement, not, maybe not so much if it's law wise, but especially um, it's also an improvement in terms of visibility because a menu bar anchored somewhere is something that you always see. Um, I told you that Elisa itself was kind of slow, um, underpowered for what it was trying to do. And um, it was also not commercially uh, really a, a success. Still, you know, the price tag and, and the, the performance given at that price tag was, was not a good selling um, point, but that was about to change. Um, I wanted to share a few things with you that I thought were really interesting uh, to give you an idea of the spirit of how these things were being developed. So here's Bill Atkinson, um, and Larry Tesler. Um, I've met Larry uh, myself when I was working at, uh, at Stanford, um, really, bright guy, uh, really bright guy. And um, Atkinson is known as one of the um, you know, core developers of many parts of the, um, the Lisa and then also the Mac um, user interface, right? So an, an amazing coder. <clears throat> and um, they, um, they tell a story um, that uh, they were basically working in sort of a, 
um, a, a day and night shift thing, right? Um, they uh, basically, you know, uh, Bill and Larry would do like 24 hour iterative development, right? Bill would go design and code things at night and then Larry would run a user study with people during the day to see how the things work that had been developed. And then they would go back, right? Each of them would work 14 hours a day that gave them two hours overlap to briefly talk to each other and, and do like a handover of what they had been doing. Uh, they both worked on the same single physical machine that was around because that, you know, that was a scarce resource at the time. Um, and um, funnily enough, um, uh, Bill Atkinson actually took Polaroid photos um, as an amateur photographer off to document the design process. I'm gonna show you a few of those in a second um, to give you an idea of how this, this stuff came about. Um, most of the, the, the mouse interaction and window interaction actually in the Delisa project was developed from scratch. So uh, Xerox licensed the idea for the mouse to, to, to Apple um, as part of an investment, but um, you know, the, the development of the code and all of these things happened from scratch. So here's an idea, here's to show you how the menu bar happened to be there and why it's there. Originally, um, a lot of the engineers that were in the Lisa project came from Hewlett Packard, HP. So, and, and that meant that they would adopt a lot of design decisions. As you can see here, um, this is a picture of, you know, soft key menus where you've got like these, actually these physical buttons at the bottom and then above that, you would display what these buttons were going to mean in each um, situation, right? So you relabel them as, as menus change. And that was the original idea to also put on the Lisa as, as the menu system. Um, but um, here is an initial picture showing you, uh, this is a, one of those Polaroids from Bill Atkinson, um, showing you that the first design was actually a soft key, uh, soft key menu. Um, the problem, of course, of that is that you're losing quite a bit of space, right? And this is not a big screen, right? We're um, talking about maybe, you know, 384 pixels in the, in the uh, vertical or something like that. Um, so we're losing space here to, to display those keys. That's not good. Also, what you're missing is you're not actually seeing the menu hierarchy, right? So imagine um, that, the, that you take, you know, a, a normal everyday, you know, today's menu bar and you put it into a soft key menu. What that mean, would mean would be that, for example, if you wanted to cut and paste something, you would have to start with the original soft keys, which would show you the first level menus. And then you would have to maybe press F1 for file commands, F2 for edit commands, F3 for formatting commands. So you'd press F2, that would open up, you know, the, um, the edit menu, uh, but now all the soft keys get relabeled because they show the options in the, in the edit menu. And then you would have to decide, you know, F1 is undo, F2 is redo, F3 is cut. Ah, okay, I need to press F3 for cutting. Um, and then, and so on. You know, so you have to go back again. Um, so it's, it's very uh, laborious and um, there, it would be difficult for you to navigate these, these menus because you only see the current hierarchy at any time. Also, what you notice in this interface uh, design here, this is a really early prototype, there is no window concept, right? No, no windows yet. So moving on then, you see here um, a, a, a second design that they had, which was uh, showing windows. And all of this was being coded right, by Bill at night you know, to, test, to, to test with Larry and, and his users during the day. Um, this now had simple windows overlapping, actually, as you can see, very bare bones. Um, and it still had the soft keys at the bottom, right? You see that row of soft keys here, but it's beginning to look a little bit more uh, like a menu bar, but it's still the soft key principle, right? Um, so not, I haven't given up on that. And then the next iteration then later on um, actually had um, started to have these men menus. And um, the problem, you know, putting that menu at the bottom, which you can't see in this prototype was you can put the menu at the bottom of the window, but then there isn't enough space to show the pull-down menu because if the, you know, the main window is covering most of your screen, then you don't have space for the pull-down menu anymore. So it would have to like come up, which would be weird. Um, so then they decided to put the, um, the window not at the, at the bottom of, uh, sorry, the menu not at the bottom of the window, but at the top of the window, as you can see here. And this might be familiar to you because this is what Windows um, has been doing for the longest time, right? Attach the menu bar to each individual window. Um, and they found, okay, so that's better. We can now actually see the menu bar and we've got this like, you know, vertical plus horizontal combination um, of pull down menus, which is good. Um, and um, 
the only problem with that was that that one problem that they discovered is that um, you know if you make that win window too small or uh, then the window uh, in the menu bar in the window will get truncated right it will get clipped off or you need to wrap it around which is horrible of course because then you can't use spatial memory to rely on where each menu item is which is something Larry found out during his user test in the day plus as we know by now from Fitz law navigating a menu bar that is attached to a window where you can overshoot very easily to go beyond the menu bar is much slower than if you attach it to the top of the screen where you cannot overshoot because the mouse just stops at the top of the screen right um, that's a fits law basic um, and uh, what you can also see here the the grow icon and how do you resize um, a window that was also something they were playing around with here it was actually placed next to the title um, in at the top left um, and they had separate horizontal and, uh, and vertical scroll bars introduced already. Um, and here now uh, we can see, you know, they decided to put the menu bar at the top of the screen and now things were becoming to, you know, fall into place. They're like, okay, um, now we, uh, we've got spatial memory sec uh, secured, right? We know where the menu bar is. It always stays at the same point. It doesn't go away. Um, you can't move windows into it, so that menu bar area is reserved, um, but it only takes up additional space for each menu when the menu drops down, and after that it disappears again, so not too big of a deal. Um, the, the infinite vertical width, of course, of the menu bar at the top of the screen is good, um, and you can now see that the grow icon went down to the bottom right, um, and then you've got you know, the vertical and horizontal um, uh, scroll bars um, that are added to the window also on the right and at the bottom. Okay, so the end, in the end, the Lisa user interface actually looked um, quite um, normal from today's point of view, uh, very much like the Mac interface that was about to follow. Um, we can see overlapping windows here. We've got the menu bar at the top, as we said. Uh, we've got the scroll bars on the right and bottom. Um, we've got the, uh, the resize uh, uh, thing here, the resize, uh, um, holder up here. So you, you, for the longest time, you could not resize windows on the Mac by just grabbing the, the, the side of the window or the bottom. You had to actually grab this little tag thing in the corner. Um, and um, this is actually running um, Mac Paint, uh, which is a, you know, was a bitmap graphic editing tool that um, um, used QuickDraw. It was very, very fast to use. Okay. Um, what, I, what I didn't share last time uh, also was this interesting comeback of a feature. So first of all, I'm going to show you an interesting um, feature of, um, that was introduced into macOS in 2011. Uh, the version back then was, was um, Lion. Um, and here's a quick uh, uh, excerpt from the uh, presentation at, at WWDC on that. Okay, so that sounds great. You know, no more you know, constantly saving because the program might crash and you might lose uh, progress, right? So not having to worry about that. Sounds like a great new innovative idea. Uh, now let's look at a short clip here that is from a demonstration um, from the Lisa that was being recorded um, that shared some of these, uh, you know, that, that had something very similar. So as you can, this, that sounds actually like a very useful thing to have, right? Um, this reverting back to a, um, a known version. And then that kind of got forgotten for 20 or 30 years or so. Um, and then it came back in, in Mac OS line, which I thought was, was quite interesting. As you can see, this was a demonstration, somebody showing a running old Lisa version that hadn't been used for many years. So this was after the Lisa project had been wrapped up for a long time. Um, so uh, that's just, again, to reiterate this thing that, you know, great ideas have often had their seeds in the past and are often just being re, uh, you know, uh, um, resurfaced and, and, and then used. Um, so that's summarizing this, what you just, just saw here, um, that you know, this was something that Apple introduced as a new feature in 2011 and it actually was something that Lisa had in 83. No, Apple in 2011 admittedly added the whole like versioning stack of it that you could go back into in this beautiful sort of, you know, uh, 3D interface where these versions would fly into your face and um, all that, uh, all that stuff. Okay. Um, now we're moving on to um, 
the uh, the successor of the leaser, um, the, the Lisa was not commercially successful, and instead a different system was. And I'm going to uh, share with you um, a little ad from the time that introduced that system. Okay, so what is this referring to? Obviously, um, I know you guys have read your George Orwell, right? So um, Orwell's 1984 dystopian um, science fiction novel of a you know all-knowing state and everything you know being controlled through that um, through the ministry, etc. Um, you know, a dark vision of the future, and this happened to be in 1984 when Apple introduced their computer, the Macintosh. Um, so what they were playing on was that at that time, IBM had released a PC in 1981 and was taking over the PC market because it had the power and was quickly becoming what people refer to as big blue, right? You know, so you know, controlling everything. Uh, and so here Apple was po uh, you know, putting themselves as the hero that breaks um, that evil monopoly of, of IBM. Sounds weird from today's point of view. Um, but, you know, that were, those were the um, uh, David versus Goliath situations back in, in 84. Um, the, this video uh, went on to uh, become uh, sort of the uh, best rated video um, commercial of all times. It ran during the first break of the Super Bowl in, um, in 83, 84. Um, and um, became sort of a, a well-known piece among uh, marketing experts. Um, it was actually uh, being uh, redone later as um, a version where this girl is wearing an, an iPod as she's uh, tossing that hammer. Uh, so there's many versions of that online that you'll find. Now onto the actual machine here. Um, um, the Mac uh, was introduced a year after the Lisa, so quite quickly. As you can see, a lot of things kept were kept the same. We still have the one button mouse that Apple held onto for a very long time. Um, and we, but we have a significantly shrunk uh, box here uh, that was much cheaper, right? So it was the follow up to the Lisa. And its key advance was really uh, that it managed to redo the ideas of the Lisa in a product that was affordable enough um, to be commercially feasible, right? This was the first commercially successful system that had a graphic user interface. So it really started the era of graphical UIs and you know, the mouse and, key, um, and, and menus and pointers and so on, making their way into everybody's home. Um, the, uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the system featured basically the, the GUI and that was coming completely new to um, the users. And it also meant that you opened up the user base of computers to a much bigger audience than before, right? It was not just targeting the office use that, that uh, Xerox had done with the Alto and the Star, which didn't work out in the end. Um, it actually also said, you know, this is also targeted hobbyists or at people who um, may have a small business, for example. Um, so not just your standard office work. Um, Probably to this day, we can say that this was uh, one of the most consistent commercial graphical user interfaces. So uh, the way that Apple made sure that you know they, they had usability was 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 very much on, on their mind. Just like with Xerox, who had gone through these you know this new process at the time of iterative user testing and testing their icons and everything about the system with users. As you could see, you know, the, the Lisa had had this iterative cycle as well with users being involved all the time. Um, and so usability was a big uh, thing for Apple and was one of their unique selling points. And they wanted to make sure that the user interface was highly consistent. So you could develop third party apps for the Mac, unlike, you know, the, the Alto, for example, but developing them, uh, you were expected to be following um, very, con you know, very high levels of, of standard consistency. And this was ensured with two ways. One was that there was a document, um, and there still is, called the Macintosh Human Interface Guidelines, which for the first time gave third-party developers a very clear set of rules of how an application is to look and feel to be consistent with everything else that's out there. So that, you know, it was basically during that time impossible to sell a program to, to Apple uh, users 
were that would not quit when you when you hit command Q or that wouldn't have a quit command as the first as the last entry in the first um, menu on the left after the at the Apple menu that was just absolutely expected right you could in theory do it differently but then users would just you know be very confused and and consider it very badly designed so in a way these human interface guidelines were given to developers developers following them led to a very high consistency um, in the applications which then reflected on the user base just having these high expectations on usability and consistency um, and um, the other thing that apple did to make that happen was not just to give out you know sort of the bible if you want but they also had what they literally called evangelists so these were people um, remember this was a time when basically no developer out there had ever written a graphical user interface program and as we will see if you join us in DIS2 next semester, writing a GUI-based application that reacts to events from the mouse and other, other devices is very different from writing you know, a simple command line tool, which people have been doing until then, or even you know, full screen uh, text-based apps. It's just a different way of, of writing code. And so they sent out these people who you know, free of charge would just tell people how good applications uh, are designed and why they're designed this way and how to do it. So they had really had a large educational effort on the developer community to get people on board for how to write good Mac apps. Um, if, you, if you are a code geek, um, I highly recommend taking a look at this. You can actually see um, two of the, 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 the most important parts of that system. Uh, QuickDraw, uh, a high-speed graphics uh, library that was written for you know, a fairly slow processor from today's point of view, um, and still able to, to render things you know, at interactive speeds, uh, written by Bill Atkinson, and also MacPaint, which was this drawing program that you just saw a minute ago, based on um, QuickDraw. It's also the, the, the program running here on that little screenshot. Uh, these are now open source, and you can find, actually, you can go and read through the code of, and see how somebody wrote um, essentially, you know, the graphics library and the graphics program for this system, which is kind of cool. Um, here's a picture of an early version of the system, Macintosh System 1.1. Um, as you can see, we've got, you know, our windows very much like as we know it. We've got the trash can here now on the desk. Uh, we can see um, uh, we can see floppy disks being inserted, um, and um, we have two kinds of um, applications. We've got the regular applications that will show you a a window, uh, which you would only have one of uh, running at any time. Um, and then you've got these desktop accessories, which were things that um, could actually run um, in parallel, if you want, during uh, you using that app. This is not a multiple uh, apps system. So if you were writing a text and then you wanted to look something up um, in, a, in a different um, uh, application, like you wanted to do a drawing, you literally had to close your text editor, open the drawing editor, uh, editing paint, like Mac Paint, and do your painting, close Mac Paint again, and go back into your text thing. This was really only one application running at the time, but it had a few desk accessories that could run in parallel, like you know, a calculator, for example. And here we can see the control panel, which shows a lot of the um, usability um, thinking being in established, giving the user lots of choices, for example, on how, how often do you want the menu to blink when you select an item? And this blink is very subtle, but it actually helps you a lot in understanding what was being selected before the menu goes away. Um, you know, re repeat times, stuff that we still see today, you know, uh, in, in our typical adjustments, like how fast do you want your mouse to go, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what's your desktop background? Um, <coughs> so, um, we will talk more about this in DIS2, where we will actually um, uh, look at why the multitasking that Lisa and the Mac did isn't actually multitasking. It's a different way of multitasking that's known as um, collaborative multitasking um, and not preemptive multitasking, which introduced some issues that were addressed later on um, when you know systems came into the late 90s. All right, um, here's something else. This is the keyboard um, of the original Mac. Does anybody notice something unusual here? Uh, yeah, uh, Prithvish, go ahead. I just had a question as in, 
Oh yeah. So it was a single application system, the Mac 1.1, right? And you said you could use the calculator on top of like when yeah. you were writing something. Yeah. Does that include also using the control panel while you were writing something or using paint or that is a separate application in itself and you had to close other applications too? Um, no, I believe it's a good question. I think you no, I think you could open the control panel while an application was running, but you know, don't uh, don't bet on that. I'm I'm not perfectly sure. The way that these accessories were implemented uh, was actually that they were basically part of an ongoing loop. That you know, your application, let's say uh, Mike Paint, was running, and then it would give a little bit of time to the system, and the system included these accessories being being processed and being handled as events and so on. Uh, I'm not perfectly sure whether the control panel was part of that or whether you actually had to close the application to get to the control panel. It, it may well be, um, but I'm not 100% sure. I, I think you probably had to go back to your finder and, and use the control panel there. Okay, thank you. So yeah, sorry, I, I would have to run an old emulator to check that. Um, uh, Rachel. Uh, yeah, the return button. Uh, like today, it's a little bit different. There's the enter button and uh, the, I think backspace is meant to be the erase button. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, well, actually, if you take a look at a modern US keyboard, I've got one uh, right right here. Uh, that's still, ugh. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work. Anyway, uh, the, uh, the, the return button looks still looks the same. Sorry, now I left, left my presentation mode. Uh, let me go back. Uh, so that is actually in, in US keyboards that still looks the same. It's it's different on a on a German keyboard, like it has this L shape. Um, but uh, something else is unusual here. Uh, Victor, go ahead. Uh, there is enter button, but there is no escape button. Okay, so no escape key. Yes, that's that's one thing. Uh, Tejasvina, Tejasvini. Oh uh, yeah, the function key is missing as well as the control key, and so. I don't know if the previous Apple keyboards had the F1, F2 keys like the Windows did. Yeah, yeah, no, no, the F keys were were lost um, because they were considered bad design, right? They were like keys that you had to look up the meaning or you had to remember the meaning yeah. for, for each uh, application. So that's why function keys never really were a big thing um, on the Mac. It instead relied on keyboard shortcuts like Control X to do stuff um, instead of function keys. Um, but I'm, I'm really surprised there. Like, I could not use this keyboard. There's something very basic is missing. Sarah, go ahead. Um, the arrow keys are missing. Yes, the arrow keys. Where are the arrow keys, right? There, there's no arrow keypad. And this is intentional, of course, right? The, the thinking behind that was some, some way along those lines saying, we want to make sure that when somebody writes a Mac application, it should be usable with the mouse. So they, they wanted to be sure that people would really, you know, developers would really write code using the mouse and not just take their existing text-based apps, put them on there and say, well, you know, you can use this old version of WordStar. I ported it to the Mac. I didn't change anything about the UI. Uh, I left it as it is. And you can use the cursor keys as you've always done uh, to navigate around your text, right? Or to navigate between forms, for example, in a form-based interface or something like that. Um, this was something that Apple didn't want. And so they literally left out the cursor keys, you know, uh, the, the arrow keys. So, so to really emphasize that the mouse was the way that you should be positioning your, your pointer. Um, but of course we know, and you'll actually um, learn more about this in this class, uh, that there are very clear reasons why you want cursor keys for a certain task, right? You don't want to constantly move between your mouse and keyboard if you are doing, for example, heavy text editing, right? You want to use cursor keys a lot. Um, so of course there were then, you know, command shortcuts to go back and forth, you know, with, with your, uh, you know, for the cursor to jump word-wise, et cetera, and sentence-wise and character-wise, but they were less convenient, right? They were, uh, they were less obvious to emphasize that the mouse was the way to go. And um, they, they quickly got um, reintroduced. So uh, cursor keys are now, of course, have, have long been a part of the, uh, the keyboard. But actually, um, if you uh, look at the, uh, the keyboard, keyboard that you get on um, the iPad, for example, 
uh, this is all coming back again, right? And on the iPhone too, right? We, for the longest time, uh, didn't have an ability to actually move the cursor character-wise on the iPad with similar thinking. You know, it's supposed to be used by a touch, which, you know, isn't actually always the best choice. Um, okay, uh, Jasper, you got a comment, go ahead. Uh, I got a question. Yeah. So, um, what exactly is the difference between the enter key and the return key? Um, I think in it may actually be, oh, down there. Yeah, good point. Um, I don't know. It still is there on today's extended keyboards. You still have an enter key at the at the way bottom of your numerical keypad. Usually, it's labeled on the Mac. It's labeled enter, and on the on the main keyboard, it's labeled return. Um, very back in the day, there was a difference. The difference was return was literally supposed to be go into the next line in a text editor, like on a on a typewriter. Whereas enter was complete the entry to, for example, a, a text field. Uh, it was basically confirming things because this is still from the time of terminals where enter would be like the send button where you send your input that you've done locally in the terminal over the serial line to the mainframe to be processed. So you could enter like a three line comment with returns and then you would send it off with the enter key essentially. But nowadays, of course, that distinction has gone away and for 99% of tools that I know, uh, return and enter are just used interchangeably. Okay. Um, Rachel, did you have a question still? No, sorry, just forgot. To... Okay, no worries. Okay. All right, so um, that's, that's the Mac. And uh, now I want to introduce you to um, a gentleman who has been uh, also shaping the, uh, the industry in, in, in big ways. And I'm not talking about Bill Gates, but very close to that. So here's a, a fake ad, I should say. Uh, for Windows 1.0, uh, done by the famous Steve Ballmer, who's um, been a great source of um, joy for the developer community. The wonderful Steve Ballmer introducing Windows 1.0. This was only a fake ad done internally for the development team to entertainment, and so this never aired, of course. Um, but uh, I think what's what's interesting about the um, uh, about Windows is that it, when you look at it, introduced in 1985, you know, a year after the Mac user interface uh, debut, uh, debuted, and it, it is actually sort of um, retro in comparison, um, making less sort of you know use of, for example, there's no overlapping windows in Windows 1.0 here, um, but. The key point, it's similar like what, the IB, what IBM did with the PC, right? You have the Apple II, and it was a successful personal computer, the first one of its kind. But IBM really made it work uh, for a large uh, you know, population of people just by, well, labeling it with the IBM label meant that now it's a business machine. Now I can buy it and can, can trust that there's a big corporation that's going to be behind it. And, and they surely were. And similarly... Uh, Windows was, of course, at this point, we had a huge population of DOS and also Unix users, uh, but mostly DOS users. Um, and they, with this, became the uh, possibility of using something like the Alto, Star, you know, Mac interaction style that had become popular um, on, their, on, their, on their existing DOS boxes, right? So this was... Um, this was definitely an advancement. I and mean, the, the, the GUI was not quite up to par. Uh, for example, you can see the menu bar being anchored inside the window, something that the, uh, the, the Mac team had um, sort of you know, discarded for a better solution in the end. And uh, you could use this in full screen or you could use it in a split screen. You had no overlapping windows, for example, in this version. Um, again, we're talk gonna talk more about this in DIS2, um, which is a class that is much more focusing on um, you know, what you might know, want to know as a developer, so about the technical aspects of Windows. And just because I can't just, I can't get enough of Steve Ballmer, and I just mentioned the word developer, so I need to show you this clip as well. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little newer, as you can see by the fact that he's got less hair. Uh, and this is from a Microsoft um, conference, right, a developers conference, similar to the WWDC at Apple. 19 seconds of joy. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, so if you ever feel let down, you know, look at uh, this, this uh, 
video for inspiration too, to know that develop, being a developer is a great thing. Um, we're going to move on because there wasn't much from an HCI perspective, innovation perspective that, that Windows added. It was really more the effect of opening up a larger market um, and then basically playing catch up with what, what uh, Mac OS was doing for the next 10 years or so. Um, and we can uh, talk about some of the other uh, systems that came around that actually had new uh, technical in influence. For example, um, also in the 80s, develop, uh, the uh, system Motif was developed and the Open Software Foundation released this. Um, this was based on the X window system, um, uh, you know, the window system that had been developed at MIT for the for Unix, uh, the, the operating system. And OSF Motif was a widget set um, and a window manager for that uh, X window system. And the key thing that was new here, uh, well, we, we get, you know, the, the two and a half D look, you know, the slightly um, uh, uh, sort of, you know, um, real yef kind of 3D-ish looking thing, but that happened around before. You even saw it in Windows 1.0, right? The slight idea of shadows to, to make things right, ra raise them from the, from the background. But the key thing that was new here was that this was actually an object-oriented toolkit architecture. So even though it was still programmed with um, plain old C, um, you actually, the toolkit itself was structured in an object-oriented fashion. So there was, for example, the concept of a, um, of, a, uh, of, a, of a label or of a push button. And then from that push button or from menu item, you would derive special uh, subclasses. So there was classing was going on, different dialogues, like there was a generic dialogue and the dialogue was then subclassing into, for example, a file system dialogue or a file open dialogue or file close dialogue or print dialogue, et cetera. So, um, and it was a very interesting way to, I, I uh, programmed with this myself and, and wrote, in, uh, wrote a tutorial for it. And it was very interesting to see how you would basically graft uh, an object-oriented concept onto a, a non-object-oriented language at the time. Um, but it definitely um, simplified development already because you had object-oriented concepts. For example, you didn't have any longer have to care about how do I manage every single event that's coming into my application. Again, more on that in DIS2. We're going to complete uh, this, this review of the key advances of, of early Windows systems here. And this is a lineage that somebody did um, of early um, graphical user interface systems, visual computing systems, as they call them, up to um, 2000. Uh, this may be a little small for you guys to see at your screen. So I encourage you to take a look uh, back at the slides later on. But I just want to point out a few things um, here. So first of all, it st all starts back up there with Memex, right? The, the early um, version that we talked about from Vannevar Bush, uh, the one that's based on microfile, uh, microfilm. Um, we can then see that Memex directly uh, you know, influenced Sketchpad, right? And it also directly influenced NLS, two of the systems that we talked about here. Um, we can also see that NLS then has a connection to the Alto, right? Um, so there was a direct inspiration here and often inspiration also means that literally people from the development team or the research team of that group went to that other group and continued their work there. So very often this is trackable through people. And from the Alto, we're moving to the Macintosh. Um, actually, be you know, there's a line that you can that you can follow through, right? So there's the Alto influencing essentially the design of the Macintosh and the Lisa here directly, right? But the Alto, of course, being you know. Um, a, an influence on the star system, which is kind of in the, the hub of this design here, if you want, um, because it introduced so many of the desktop-based um, systems. You can see the star system actually influenced Windows quite directly, whereas the Alto was more of an influence on the Mac and the Lisa. Um, we see that Smalltalk as, a, um, as, a, as an object-oriented language and environment um, had an influence on uh, uh, things all the way down to um, uh, down to Java. Uh, I think that's uh, somewhere here on the right hand side. Um, oh yeah, here's the Java. Uh, here's here's the Java line. You know, going Oak, uh, Smalltalk, Oak, uh, Java, um, and then J2ME. Um, and we also have a lineage here that that covers the history of word processors. Right? We mentioned the Bravo editor, which was part of um, the the Alto system. Uh, which then actually um, spun out over you know a variety of things you know basically directly into Word um, and here's PageMaker, WordPerfect, early other versions that we we saw. If there's other things in here that are interesting. For example, you can see PDF is a format that's derived from PostScript, which in itself 
was actually one of the concepts that was also um, being brought in, in, in the Alto uh, with its WYSIWYG uh, design. So, you know, my, my point of this, you know, oh, here, by the way, here's the Mac OS, right? OS 10, uh, is that? No, sorry, that's not OS 10, uh, I got that wrong. The, uh, this, this is OS 10 over here, um, you know, being derived from uh, the classic Mac um, and next step, and this goes back to the Macintosh, of course. Um, Linux is in there too. My point is not so much to dwell in the past and, and the glorious days of old, but my point is that it really shows nicely that none of these things just fell from the sky, right? All of these things were heavily influenced by earlier uh, programming systems and were really almost more of an evolution. Of course, every generation of, of new developments added new things, right? For example, we've got the Apple Newton here, which was a very early um, scribble-based, like handwriting input-based uh, personal organizer. Um, and that then influenced, for example, the Palm OS, and you know, the Palm was a later version of that and the Pocket PC platform and so on. Um, but all these things are derivable from earlier, uh, earlier efforts. We're gonna talk about a, um, an article that I found uh, a couple of years ago and um, that inspired me to, to extend it with a, uh, some thoughts on my own um, that covers how technology moves through different phases. Um, and there's a, a model of three phases of a typical technology life cycle for much of consumer technology that um, David Little introduced um, and that I extended with a, with a fourth uh, phase, which I think um, he, he didn't, uh, he, he overlooked in a way. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, David Little, by the way, is a, is a luminary from, from the early HDI days. He, he wrote the display controller for the Alto. He was the project lead um, for the STAR project at Xerox. Um, and um, he's since been involved in many um, other research um, initiatives and, and research labs. Um, and um, he proposed this, uh, these three phases in, in, the, uh, um, um, in the book by uh, Bill Mogridge. You can find, uh, find this, the one that I, proposed, that I suggested to you the other day. And that last phase on the sweet spot was something that I published in an Interactions magazine article in 2008. So what is this about? Um, it's about force shifts that happen and, uh, and, and sort of uh, differences of how products typically get introduced as a technology and how they then evolve over time. Um, from an enthusiast, hobbyist phase where it's mostly about just, you know, exploiting the new technology in some way to a professional phase uh, where it's being used in work contexts um, and helps people do their jobs to a consumer phase where it influences everyday life and is you know, being used to, to make life more enjoyable in, any, in some way. And then often reaches a sweet spot and unfortunately usually doesn't stop there but often moves into what I would call a Baroque phase uh, where things just keep getting grafted onto it to keep selling the product in new iterations. And that sweet spot uh, at the consumer phase is something that I think we're often um, don't pay attention to and just keep going uh, when we've really reached a, a, a wonderful equilibrium. Um, <clears throat> so let me show you, I think this is best explained by some examples. Um, the first one is a very personal example. This is a picture of um, me in uh, San Diego. Um, and uh, I was trying to you, I was trying to use GPS navigation, right? So I had this PDA, which is kind of like, you know, an, a Stone Age device in itself from the 90s. And that PDA was actually able to run a, a software that would um, show you a map of, you know, the area you were in. You could download maps of different areas, like for example, Southern California. And um, it could even plan a route for you. It could even show you directions for that route, but it didn't have a GPS built in because that was unheard of. So I had the separate GPS device um, and this GPS device I could attach, you know, using a bunch of cables to my PDA. Then both of them of course needed power because the batteries would be dra drained way too fast. So lots and lots of cables, but in theory I could then actually have a GPS in my car, right? This was sort of clearly the enthusiast hobbyist phase of of GPS nav navigation technology, right? Um, it's something where 
if you're really a nerd, then you can use it, but you mostly do it just for the kicks of, you know, playing with the new technology, not really to be more effective or more, you know, productive in your life. Um, and that's okay, right? That's often how these things come around. You know, GPS, wow, I can buy a GPS receiver. Wow, amazing, right? You know, GPS only became available to, to people like you and me in 2001, right? Before the, uh, the precision of the GPS uh, global uh, navigation system was actually artificially limited by the military, the US military, so you couldn't actually use it for this kind of stuff. So anyway, uh, that's the first phase, right? And then it moves into a professional phase. And in the example of GPS, it was quickly clear that you could build these versions into, um, for example, truck fleets and have the drivers of these, these trucks use this for more efficient navigation. So it was, they were using it on the job, right? So the interface was clunky. It was a big device, but you, know, you built it into that truck. It was expensive, of course, but it really made sense economically because you know, the payoffs were so great. And by the way, here I'm not talking about like live updates or, or any internet connectivity mobile, right? That didn't exist, right? This was really only for just getting from A to B um, with, with live directions based on GPS uh, uh, receivers. So it helped people get their job done. And then the next phase was when people realized, oh, okay, I think we can sell this to consumers, right? Because by then, you know, GPS uh, receivers had become small enough and displays had become, you know, decent enough that you could build actually a device like the one here on the left that would get you could use for hiking, right? So you could get this and you would get um, instructions on it, where to go, and it had a little black and white display. Um, and it was small enough and decent enough battery life that you could actually start using this um, in, in life, right? Uh, and, you know, this was then, you know, in the, in the uh, somewhere in the 2000s, and ultimately, then, um, uh, what you could what you could do was basically, you know, th this is sort of the sweet spot, right? The navigation system, the GPS that you guys all know that you can just, you know, stick to your car, right, uh, to your car dashboard, um, and that totally that was the game changer, right? All of a sudden, you could go out, buy this thing at your local electronics store or online, stick it to your car, um, ha tap in a destination address and go. And that was really a game changer. I mean, it led totally to the fact that people don't know what their cities look like anymore because, you know, they all just navigate using their GPSs. Um, but what we observed after that then, after the GPS had gotten, you know, this far, um, the NAFSAT system, is that it, it entered a Baroque phase where people tried to add more and more features to it. For example, TomTom themselves um, had later versions of their, of their device where you could actually install a a photo slide show viewer on your GPS while you're driving a car. So, hmm, maybe not the best idea. But I mean, you can see how this came about, right? They were like, crap, everybody's bought a GPS. What are we going to do, right? They, they're all using it. What, what can we do? And sure, and there, there were you know, other kinds of innovations and, and GPSs, you know, while, the, while the GPS device as, it, as its own is kind of dying out, um, you know, the portable one, because it gets replaced by the smartphone. There are new features in there, live traffic updates, et cetera, that make sense. But this was an example of uh, trying to put more stuff into this phase. Let me show you another example of consumer technology. Let's take the smartphone or the cell phone. Um, not, this is actually not the smartphone, not the smartphone, you know, that started with the iPhone, but actually the cell phone uh, before that, right? This in the mid 90s, you know, you, you couldn't actually, you know, it started to be possible to buy cell phones. But early on, you basically bought a bunch of electronics, right, from an electronics store like DigiKey, and you had like a, a GSM receiver, and you could build yourself something cool with it. This was for nerds only, for hackers. Um, and then, you know, we, we entered the, the phase of um, the, professional, um, uh, the professional phone. Uh, this was one that you would actually you know, like. It was being transported in a in a suitcase, right? And and you could basically have that built into your your car if you wanted to. Um, but they were mostly being used by people who needed these for work because the the price was so high that it needed to have a a business uh, payoff. Um, and. We then saw, of course, the consumer phase starting with devices like this, you know, the early cell phones that came out um, that you could then, you know, had long stand, you know, not very long standby times. There were charges for calling every single minute, you know, that were kind of ridiculous up to like, you know, um, half a euro per minute and so on. Um, and 
but these were the devices that ultimately then led to what I would consider the sweet spot for, you know, let's call them dumb cell phones, right? The ordinary cell phone uh, that Nokia had, like with the, the, the 3210 and those kinds of uh, 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 cell phones. Those were literally the game changer because all of a sudden, you know, a lot of things changed, right? For example, people used to have, you know, long conversations beforehand to say, oh, we're all here at this conference in this foreign city. Let's make sure that we all meet at 8 p.m. in this bar tonight, right? And then you had to somehow make sure that happens and nobody could talk to anybody else and so on because nobody had a cell phone. Once cell phones were there, this kind of problem went away, right? Um, losing your partner on a, on, a, on a street market and then everybody shouting at the other person, but, you know, I was looking for you all the time. No, I was looking for you. All that, you know, went away, right? You just basically call the other person. Um, but what happened after the cell phone was at this point was that it entered a Baroque phase, which I'd like to uh, exemplify with this device here in um, an iPack from, from Hewlett Packard, which was still essentially a cell phone, but it had put a tiny little version of Windows onto it, um, was operated with a little you know, pen and had tiny little icons and was trying to offer you basically a whole productivity suite uh, on this touch screen. And it was really awkward, right? You could also see that now with more and more keys uh, were fighting over the space on the, on the surface, uh, on the interface with the, with the screen. So the screen was supposed to be bigger. The keys had to be more of them. So you needed more space for both of them, but the device was not supposed to get bigger. So there was this awkward sort of design tension that was really pressing in on the solution. And a lot of these devices, we ran a study around 2000, I don't know, eight or nine or so after the iPhone had come out, just, just sort of around the time when the smartphones had come out, um, we ran a study for the magazine Connect, um, a cell phone magazine. Um, and we found that the features were nice that these, these um, sort of devices added, but the form factor was completely overloaded. The metaphor of the cell phone with its buttons and the little screen was just not enough anymore to push more and more functions onto it, right? Um, and of course, again, this resolved itself ultimately, this Baroque phase with a revolution uh, that then just did away with all the buttons um, and introduced a smartphone. Um, and that of course is a design um, trade-off that has its own problems. Typing on a smartphone is horrible, even by today's standards. It's not good, it's better if you have keys, but you know, it made room for a large screen that could have a very flexible user interface where you could do all kinds of things on it without having to worry about what your buttons mean in every application. So the difference here, there's a difference, I think, uh, between sweet spot devices and, and these devices that enter the Baroque phase. Um, sweet spot devices really simplify your life. Um, they give you a new kind of support. You have to learn just a few new things and you get an almost magical boost in your abilities, right? Uh, Take, take, the, take the example of the GPS, right? If the, one, the moment you could stick something to your car and it already suddenly told you where to go, this was a game changer, right? Before that, you know, driving was a hassle and you had to like, you know, listen to instructions from your, from your you know, co-driver and then they would get confused and, and it was like really, really difficult. And that was really a game changer. Um, and that functionality really is, is rule changing, right? It makes it really makes a, a difference. It changes the rules of how, how stuff is being done. Um, similarly with the cell phone when it arrived, right? Uh, similarly also with the smartphone when it arrived, right? That again was a new kind of game changer. Uh, I remember getting the first iPhone and even though it was slower than the, in terms of network connectivity before than what I had had before, um, you know, it was only, you know, edge instead of 3G at the time. But the web browser was so usable all of a sudden that actually for the first time in my life, I actually used it, used the mobile web browser to look something up while I was in a store um, in 2007, you know. Um, so these, these things change the game. Uh, um, and then there's the Baroque phase. Oops, sorry. Uh, the Baroque phase that on the other hand actually complicates your life, right? You know, so if you have more and more functions on your GPS, it gets harder to use. You have to constantly update it. You have to connect it to your computer to keep things in sync, etc. Um, you know, to download your latest photos for that photo slideshow feature, whatever, um, it actually gets more difficult to use because every feature you add to a device 
makes it harder to use, right? That's that's just a, a, a rule of, of nature. You cannot, you know, the complexity in the interface goes up. And then you sometimes have to just radically redesign to, to establish a new metaphor, a new way of thinking about the device, a new conceptual model for the user to work with in order to keep being able to keep adding more, more functionality. Um, uh, Victor, I had a, co a comment, go ahead, or a question. Yeah, I have a question uh, with respect to cell phones that you showed in a previous example. So iPhone, it's a more a consumer phase because uh, it's like new cool design with new features, but still it's not, it's kind of for me also a Barocco style because we add more things into usual cell phone also to sell it. <laughs> yeah, so I would actually distinguish what I showed you as these four phases was literally meant for the traditional cell phone. I think okay. the move to the smartphone with its all touch screen, with its app, and app ecosystem and all that kind of stuff, um, it is a different class of device. That's actually how I think um, mobile communication broke out of its Baroque phase, right? So what we're, today, what we're seeing today are not continuations of this um, PDA metaphor that you saw in the Baroque phase where you've got like your, your tiny desktop basically and a tiny keyboard underneath. Uh, but we've, we've created a new metaphor, right? With, with the iPhone, we have a new metaphor of how we interact with information. It does have its own drawbacks, but it did open up that, you know, that, that space again so that we could go into a new round of that cycle, right? I think the, the iPhone then was, uh, in, in, in a certain way, it was maybe different because the pay, there we had a device that was initially immediately targeting consumers. Um, so it may not always be that you have a commercial deployment in the technology before you see a consumer adoption, but many of the technologies that were in the iPhone, of course, did have development that was built around consumer, uh, about uh, around professional devices first, right? It's very much like um, when, you, when you take, you know, the, uh, the, the, the PC itself or the laptop or something like this, um, or the internet, for example, itself, right? It, or the web, all these things were first created for professional reasons in some way. And then sort of saw, somebody saw that you could create a consumer product out of it. Um, so, what, what I'd like you to, to encourage you is to think back, you know, to maybe um, events in your daily life, you know, maybe the last time that you saw a new interaction, interactive electronic device or, or service that truly simplified your life, you know, making things easier than before, removing or, or at least cutting down on an unnecessary task, right? There, I think we all have examples from that in our daily lives. And then secondly, you can think about, um, you know, an interactive system or, or, or service that you use that actually felt like it was making your life more complicated, um, you know, requiring, you know, complex steps to set it up without giving you the same sort of huge payoff that this, you know, that, that you had expected. So I think you'll find examples for that in your, in your own environment. I encourage you to think about that and look at interactive technologies when you use them and, and wonder like, is this really a sweet spot device? Is it, or is it already in its Baroque phase? Is this making my life simpler or is it making my life more complex? Um, I remember I, I um, met Don Norman the other day and he, he, told, uh, he told us that he'd um, installed Nest thermostats in his, in his entire apartment, you know, the, the uh, internet connected IoT kind of like smart thermostats. And he thought they would simplify his life. They would be like a sweet spot device, right? But they turned out to be far from that. They made his life more complicated because this thing wasn't, it wasn't easy to just tell it to set the temperature to this temperature right now. You know, it was, it was difficult. It learned things and it was hard to overwrite those rules. So it wasn't really um, paying off in that way. All right. So now um, we're going to take a look at how people in the recent past thought about what we're going to be expecting in the future. There's got lots of directions here. Um, of course, that you can find. And we're just going to present a few trends here, very, very select. But I would say probably most people that you will meet in the HCI research community or practitioner community uh, will have heard of these systems because they really influenced um, the thinking of what we're working with today. So from today's point of view, I want you to think about um, a couple things here. Um, from today's point of view, what of, which of the aspects that you're going to see in these videos um, have become standard, our common sense today. It's like, yeah, of course, this, is, this, this has 
this vision of the future has become reality. That's what we're doing today. And it's no longer exciting or new. It's, it's become something that we just consider as self-evident. And then also interesting, which of these aspects that you're going to see in these videos hasn't come through uh, true in the same way? And if, if that is so, then, uh, then why might that be, right? So that's an in, another interesting question for you. Um, why did certain things uh, not turn out the same way? Okay. Um, and then another thing to, finally, if you can put yourself maybe in the shoes of the audience back then, right? When I'm going to tell you from what, what year these videos were, and we by now but know roughly where the technology was at that point, right, from what we just talked about. Um, what was the vision likely provoking in the audience? Would people say like, wow, this is awesome, or is it maybe you know, critical? Um, and what, what, are, what did the authors intend? Like, what were the key new ideas that the authors were trying to push? What's the key new interaction technique that they were trying to show a vision of? Um, and finally, how did they prototype it? How did they communicate it? Because all these things you're going to see, none of these were fully working, um, you know, commercialized, industrially available systems, right? You couldn't just go out and buy them. They were all uh, some or sometimes many years in the future. The first one I'm going to show you is uh, put that there. Put that there uh, was from a uh, SIGGRAPH paper, SIGGRAPH is a highly respected academic conference, um, in 1980. So just a quick and uh, uh, you know, orientation here, 1980, so that means the Alto is out, but the star isn't yet. The IBM PC hasn't been invented yet. The Apple II is currently the personal computer, the only personal computer you can buy. Um, and nobody outside research labs has really worked with a graphical user interface yet, right? Um, on the other hand, of course, everybody's seen, you know, in the research communities has seen the NLS and, and Sketchpad videos and stuff like this. So these guys um, try to share something uh, with, a, with a community that was built around mostly around the question of how can we, A, use the gesture input from people, but more than that, not just use the gesture input, but actually combine uh, that gesture input with the voice input at the same time. Now, uh, this system actually used um, a, a real speech rec uh, engine, so a real speech recognition and a real speech synthesis engine. That's why the, the voice in there really, really sounds like a robot, right? So you're going to hear um, the, the system talk back to the user, and it's very funny. It's, it's really an 80s. 1980s robot voice. Um, but pay attention to the multimodality of, that's going on here. And as, as a computer scientist, think about what would I need to actually implement to make that work, right? What, what's going on here with the events coming in from different channels, from gesture, from voice? How would that work? All right, uh, there's two parts to this one. The first one is, um, is, is a solo setting, and the second one is a collaborative setting with two users. What they're going to be doing is they're going to look at a map of uh, the, Medi uh, the, uh, the Caribbean, um, you know, Central America, and they're going to um, use uh, an app in front of them running on a big screen to place uh, vessels like ships and stuff like that and, and to reorganize them. And they're going to talk to the system to place these vessels for them using pointing and, and voice in com combination, just to give you a bit of setting. Okay, so a couple things here that, that are of interest, uh, I think. First of all, what you've seen is actually um, um, speech recognition um, at work and also some basic AI uh, at work trying to parse the grammar of what people are saying, um, asking back if certain things weren't understood um, and so on, right? It actually even had, if you pay close attention, it had... Um, um, a command history, right? It looked back, it could say like where that was, um, so it knew what it had been doing before. So sometimes I wish that actually, you know, even today's voice assistants were, were doing that kind of dialogue where they really ask back if something is unclear rather than just not understanding what we're doing or doing something different. 
Um, the second thing here that's interesting is the mix of, of interaction styles, of course, you know, where you point at something and then you say something and these events are somehow mixed together to make a coherent command to the computer, um, especially when you do that with two people, right? There was uh, some kind of um, uh, rights management going on. You could protect an object and then the system would ask, the other per would ask you if the other person could move it before they did. Um, also noticeable that they were able to talk to each other without completely throwing off the, um, the voice system, um, but that they did have to use some kind of keywords uh, in order to trigger, for example, a collaborative movement, right? Um, okay, so that's, uh, let's put that there. Um, again, remember 1980, um, interesting multimodal interface that combines things. Um, a second version of multimodal interface um, is, um, I would probably say more far reaching. Uh, this is the Apple Knowledge Navigator, a video from 1988. So the Macintosh had been out for a few years um, but, you know, beyond, uh, you know, evolving the graphical user interface and getting into CD-ROMs with multimedia content and all that kind of stuff of the late, uh, late uh, of, of these times. Well, that, that actually, that wasn't even around 1988, sorry. Um, so we're really talking about like, you know, the Mac just being out for four years here. And multimedia is, is on the horizon, right? It's, it's like the cool next thing to do. Um, this is a mock-up um, uh, of a vision in a video that was not implemented, um, but it was a um, very professionally produced video by Apple. As you can see, much, much different from this kind of nerdy you know, researcher video that we just saw, therefore put that there. Um, and it was really trying to get people enticed and it succeeded uh, at the idea of a user agents, so things that are going to be working for you in, in their own role, and multimedia as, you know, the combination of video and video conferencing and audio recordings and graphics and so on. Uh, that, that was the big thing. We will see a device here in use. The story that we're going to see is of a professor who is in his office uh, and who is basically talking to this device to, to plan his lectures, to deal with incoming messages from students, from his from his mother um, and to you know, basically arrange his daily schedule. He's gonna place a video conference with a colleague to discuss a research question that just comes up to him. Um, it's, it's actually an ecological question. So it's about you know, rainforest, rainforest deforestation and, and the growth of, of the Sahara. Um, play, pay attention in particular here to how this agent that is running on that little device in front of him, how that agent takes part in the conversation. There are some assumptions in there that should make you uh, stop and take another look because you will probably find that some of the things that the system is doing sound perfectly natural in the setting, but they are completely uh, a miracle how to do them even today. We, are, we might just be getting at the beginnings of that now with deep learning networks and, and all those kinds of things. So um, here's, the, here's the video. All right, Knowledge Navigator. So, um, just a couple things here to, to maybe uh, point out. You're gonna be uh, looking at these in, in, in more detail in, in the assignments, but um, I think we're seeing some, some things that are not particularly likely to work even today, right? That the, uh, there was a significant use of AI and a lot of contextual understanding of what, how the agent was following the discussion. So take another peek at some of those moments in the in the video again, um, to and 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 derive the the assumptions that Apple was making in 1988 about how things would be working in I think it was 2011, right? He said like five years ago, 2006. So this was a video that was supposed to be taking place around 2011. Um, there are some things to notice about that prototype on the on the table there about the display, how it works, and, and there were some assumptions there. Um, but the key thing here, of course, is a um, uh, an assumption of um, uh, kind of like a deep learning, deep AI, uh, you know, strong AI kind of um, assistant that really can follow along with the conversation, and of course also the. Uh, universal law that uh, mothers will always be calling you to remind you of things no matter uh, what century you're living in. Okay, so uh, the next one that I want to show you 
is uh, a bit different. Uh, this is by Sun, the company that uh, was very big in, in um, computer workstations in the, in the 90s. Um, and uh, they created a video uh, called Starfire. This was a video prototype of a system that they imagined as the future sort of of um, how you would communicate and, and do computation at your workplace. So like a future office desktop kind of um, vision. It was created by Bruce Tognazzini, um, who uh, was running the Human Factors Engineering Group at Sun. Um, and he had been um, one of the uh, key architects of the Mac user interface before. He'd done lots of the um, iconography on the, on the Macintosh and uh, moved then to Sun to work with them on human factors. Um, the goal was different from what, what Apple was trying to do. Apple's video was quite sort of out there, right? And making uh, bold assumptions about what a computer could understand and, and, and parse and, and uh, relate to. They were actually trying to show a system that would really be realistic within 10 years. So the video was done in the, like, the early 90s and the story um, that they are showing actually has a particular date attached to it, November 16th, 2004. Um, so that in itself is, of course, 16 years ago now. Um, so again, you know, keep some notes. What's realistic now? What's kind of like, you know, old, old news by now? And what isn't or what has turned out to be completely different from what these assumptions were? Um, the story, just to help you like place this, is going to be about a, uh, an office worker who is, um, she's an engineer. She's, she's working on a, on a new... Um, um, electric car design, of course, right? You know, um, and uh, she's she's trying to meet a deadline and uh, and and create some promotional material um, to to get the get her car idea approved by the um, by her boss um, and and by the by the staff meeting. Some. Something that struck me with this video in particular is that it actually um, it does something that you wouldn't normally expect from uh, from a video that shows a prototype. Does anybody have an idea of what's what's sort of a bit unusual about about this video? There were several instances. Yeah, Elena, go ahead. Maybe for that time that uh, like two women are working on like such a new thing oh yeah so so definitely they were trying to be also progressive concerning gender issues yes. um but I, I was more thinking about the sort of h about the situation of interacting with the system i think julia you had something uh, i generally had a question about the video because there was a scene but i'm not sure about that one uh where she was eating something and it was lying on the desk and it looked like it was like first it was just I don't know, uh, in the computer, and then she took it out and ate it. And I was like, I was thinking, oh, that was, okay. did it just yeah. look weird or did she really get it out of the computer? No, 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 this is not, this is not a, a Star Trek replicator. No, they didn't go that far. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, like I said, this was supposed to be all realistic. No, what's going on there, and if you watch it again, you'll, you'll see the details, um, is that she put her sandwich on the surface that she had unpacked earlier. And just like with the, with the news article, the system had automatically scanned her sandwich. And so uh, when she picks it up, she wipes away the digital copy of her sandwich because obviously she didn't want her sandwich scanned. And this okay. is actually one of the examples of the kind of things that I think is interesting about this video that is different from what you would normally see in a, essentially a product vision video. Any thoughts? Yeah, Rachel, go ahead. Yeah, they also showed the flaws that the system can have and that yeah. can be further improved. Exactly. So you're actually seeing things, little mistakes that happen, like like the, the, the Norman kind of, you know, uh, errors, mistakes, slips that we talked about, some of these you actually see happening here, right? And also the, the characters aren't perfect, right? You know, I mean, like Julie, the main character has a cold, right? And that's being sort of referenced to throughout the, the video. That helps to give this a little more 
of a realistic touch and nothing is all perfect in everyday life. So just making sure that this, the story is a little balanced in that way. Um, but also the, uh, the little sort of technical glitches of the system when it doesn't recognize a voice command, for example, or, um, you know, when, when it scans the sandwich without you know, it being, being useful, those kinds of things were built in on purpose. Remember, this is a video prototype. So they could make up all of this stuff and imagine they were sitting there and saying like, okay, so what could go wrong? That's a very interesting point that you often forget when you try to tell a vision of a new system, new interactive technology. A lot of the product videos that I see, you know, the vision videos that companies make are like how this is all going to be so great, right? And no flaws and everything's going to work perfectly. Well, we know it won't, right? And so I think it's, it's, a, it's a very honorable sort of effort to make the video so that it shows something a little bit more realistic and shows how the system then maybe recovers from mistakes that happen, right? Um, we saw, I mean, some things are clearly dated, right? So the fact that the, um, the recording was done of this guy next to the car and put into a tiny little analog film capsule, I mean, that thing doesn't even make sense anymore today, right? Um, nobody's using analog film anymore. But um, other things like the, um, for example, the privacy issues, right? You, we saw her watching somebody get flowers in her office and then at some point somebody proposed to that. Like, of course, that, that was built in on purpose to bring up the issue that we can have this video conferencing unit, we can have it with like always on video even, but if we do, we're creating kind of a surveillance system too, which in this case is sort of being, you know, uh, Put up, for, put up for discussion, although, you know, the story told around it is just, you know, okay, she sees this person getting flowers and then somebody proposing to her in the office. Um, so it's an interesting example of, 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 you know, fading in other issues that a system like that can have and that people should be aware of when they, when they introduce it. Um, in all, of course, the, uh, the, the, the system, I mean, is, is dominated by this huge sort of um, curved screen there, which is a complete fake, right? It's not just curved to the side, it's also curved um, down towards the surface of the, of the user's desk, right? Um, so it's basically one continuous sort of vertical, horizontal, uh, ginormous uh, touchscreen um, system. Um, and, and that is actually um, a good example. Right? I mean, they never built a system that actually did that, right? It wasn't working for, uh, for real. Um, but they created a video to propose this, uh, this thing as an interaction that could be possible once these displays um, become available. So some of the guidelines that uh, the Starfire video team created out of this experience um, and that they also sort of followed in their process was to, you know, if you have a 10 year time frame, you have to continuously question your assumptions, not just assume Maybe, you know, the, the Knowledge Navigator guys went a bit overboard right, with the assumptions of what their assistant could understand. Um, whereas here, the uh, Starfire team really tried to stay realistic within a given time frame so that you don't just create, you know, Star Trek um, replicators, for example. And they iterated their video prototype just like any other prototype. We'll be talking about iterative de development later in this class. And the video prototype is just another form of prototyping that you also need to iterate over. Your first version is not gonna be the one that you want to keep. Um, including things that go wrong in, as part of the story was a big part. Um, avoiding impossible hardware designs is a big one. It's very easy to just make assumptions. Um, like when you notice the, the, the knowledge navigator, when he opens up this little uh, you know, uh, device in the beginning, it just unfolds um, and it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a seamless screen, right? With uh, obviously a, a 90 degree or 180 degree fold in the middle. Well, we're still struggling to get that to work today, right? Um, so avoiding impossible hardware designs is a big, big one to, to watch out for. And to design the interface first, like you were designing the product you know, to the prototyping stage, you don't have to build it, obviously you can't because not all of it is commercially available, but you know, then decide what the film scenes are uh, that you want to cut based on, on your budget. For example, what you can see here is that a lot of the shots are showing um, using a mouse or using voice commands or using a reverse angle, looking back at the actor in front of the device, rather than uh, shooting across the user's shoulder and having to make something work that shows up on the screen at the exact right timing and do lots of you know, uh, post editing. 
um, or you know, do pen input where you need to draw something following the pen tip in real time and so on. So um, this is covered in a little more detail in a short uh, article that Bruce Tognazzini uh, published on the Starfire video prototype um, at CHI 94 um, as, a, as a case history. Um, so please take a look at that. Um, and the other thing, um, you know, this, this document is basically this, those guidelines that, that, that evolved from the project and you can find it on the ACM uh, digital library. If you want to know more about this, this is not required, it's just a recommendation. Uh, there's a book called Tog on Software Design, uh, which the original working title for that was Starfire, actually, for the book, uh, which he wrote based on, you know, uh, his experiences at, uh, at Apple and Sun on, on how to design software. Um, as a little side note, I found this, I've always found this system sort of a, an, an inspiring, inspiring uh, example of an office setup of the future. And uh, we actually went ahead and, um, you know, I guess 20 years later, actually built this device. Um, this is the bent desk, which is, has been sitting in our project room here for quite a few years. And the bent desk is a published um, research project that we did um, that actually employed a uh, seamless, you know, vertical, horizontal touch surface in, in one go. And that we learned really interesting things about how people interact with such devices. Because this is pretty much the first time that somebody has actually interacted with a non-planar surface. All the other interactions that people do are on plain screens when they touch or, or you know, drag or, or, or flick. And here we could explore what happens when people drag and flick and, and touch and, and so on, on a non-planar touch surface that hasn't been hadn't been looked at before. Um, okay, so that's the Sun Starfire video. Now, a few more technologies that, that actually had very early beginnings to just reiterate this thing that, you know, things have a long nose of innovation, right? They start a long time back in the past and then they keep getting um, reapplied, improved on, and then ultimately become available. For example, VR, I mean, VR headsets have become a thing that you could just go out and buy as a private person, um, you know, for as a consumer to play with in your in your home, um, you know, during the last five to 10 years, right. Um, but the uh, first virtual reality headset was actually created by the same Ivan Sutherland, um, who did uh, Sketchpad, and this is PhD thesis in 1967. And here we see a picture of that um, VR headset, maybe not quite as wearable as today's devices. Um, but um, it was creating the illusion of being in a three-dimensional world of computer-generated objects you know, um, that, that early. So it's an interesting, um, interesting in interaction mode. Now, um, um, VR, of course, has had a, um, a large promise and has been covered in, in you know, vision videos again and again. Um, and the key promise, of course, being to be in a physical space that is not reality, right? And for certain things, it makes perfect sense. Like when you want to be inside a, a, a human cell to see what it's like in there, to shrink yourself down to that and explore it. For many other situations where you want to be in the real world and just add information to it, augmented reality is an interesting variant um, that um, may make more sense and may be more useful. I'll, I'll show you an example of um, early uh, work that inspired sort of this idea that technology gets integrated into our natural environment rather than us moving into a virtual space. Uh, and that movement was called ubiquitous computing. It was um, pioneered by Mark Weiser, who um, joined Park around like the late 80s um, and then quickly became Park's chief technology officer. Um, he unfortunately passed away uh, in 1999, uh, but he coined the term ubiquitous computing back in, in 1988 and is the father of this sort of fast, of this movement. Um, he uh, wrote a paper, uh, the, nine, the Computer for the 21st Century, uh, which is probably one of the most uh, often cited papers in uh, certainly the HI literature, maybe even in computing literature in general, um, that basically claims that what happens with the most profound technologies is that they disappear because you no longer notice them. It's not like they disappear because they go away, you don't have them anymore. They disappear because you don't notice them anymore. And um, he gives lots of examples of that. For example, writing, you know, early on in like the, um, you know, in, in, in ancient times, you had to know how to make your ink, how to bake the clay to write on or something like this. 
Um, and today, you know, writing is on everything, right? It's on, it's on, on candy wrappers. Uh, you can't imagine a modern world without writing, right? It's, it's impossible to imagine. Um, and if you compare what we're at with information technology, so Mark Weiser said, um, we are still at that scribe stage, right? You have to still know a lot about the technology to actually use it competently. Um, he gave another nice example, which I think makes a lot of sense if you think about it. In the 1900s, you know, when, when you know, the steam engine had been invented and motors were being in, uh, placed into, uh, into, into companies and, and electrical motors and joined them soon, um, you had one engine per factory, right? That was sitting in the center of the, end of the factory floor. And then there were long belts going to all the different machines that it was driving because the engine was the big thing, right? The, the, the center, and it was so complex and, and expensive. And now you've got, um, you know, 22 motors in your average car. Probably that number has gone up to hundreds now uh, in modern cars since he wrote this. Um, you know, lifting your, your, your windows up and down, driving your wipers, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't, you don't even notice them, right? They're hard to actually notice. It's hard to take count of how many electrical motors are in your car. It's not only that one combustion engine or electrical engine that's driving your car. It's lots of them. And it's unnecessary to know how many there are because they just work, right? They disappear in the fabric of everyday life, as, as Weiser put it. So the idea is that reason uh, really, um, you know, the, um, the technologies that are really successful, like writing or, um, or, or, or motors, really just disappear and we don't notice them anymore. And that's what he was envisioning back in the uh, 80s. Um, for computing to happen, right? To, be, to have computing become such a quiet and unnoticeable technology that we just use it without having to think about it very much at all. He then, uh, in this article, has a wonderful little scenario that I'm just gonna, gonna glance over here um, that where he uh, talks about the neighborhood where the neighbors leave their house earlier and they leave tracks, not in the real snow, but sort of virtual tracks that he can see, um, which basically tells him something about his neighborhood. Um, and of course, immediately brings up the privacy versus sort of coziness friendly neighborhood aspect. Um, he still talks about a paper newspaper, not, not reading on an iPad, but with an electronic pen where you can mark up things and scan them and, and take them into your digital uh, personal library, so to say. Um, and, and cut them out digitally. Um, he has a wonderful example how he, he loses the manual to the gr uh, garage door opener, but the manual actually has a little tag attached to it, um, something that the uh, Ubicom calls a tab. Um, that is a tiny little tracker, similar to like a tile these days. Uh, and that lets you find that garage door opener manual again. Um, he has not just a rear view mirror in his car, but he also has a four view mirror that looks ahead and that tells them where traffic jams are and where parking spots are and where certain shops are. So if you think back uh, to the GPS in the car, that's actually something that, you know, some of that actually happened, right? Some of that we're still working on. Um, he has in, at the office there a fresh coffee indicator because people still aggregate around the real physical coffee machine, drinking real physical coffee, not just sitting in their offices and, and video chatting. They want to get together physically unless there's an epidemic right, like right now. But you know, everybody wants to know when the coffee is ready. So he has this indicator uh, that people have in their office. Um, and collaboration in general, in his vision of Ubicomp, he envisioned with um, tiny devices um, that uh, are like you know, these little tabs that you put on a, on a book, but also larger devices. We'll talk about them in a minute. Um, and then if you really want to collaborate actively on content, you would move to a really large device um, called a board, which is kind of like an interactive whiteboard. Most um, significantly maybe, apart from this fading into everyday life thing, is that um, he imagined to effortlessly move his content between machines, displays, etc. cetera. Um, and there's an example in the video that you're about to see where you can actually see that happening. And that's something we are still struggling with today. You know, just sharing, I've got content here on my smartphone. I want to quickly share with everybody on a computer and then others should be able to take it with them. That still isn't quite as smooth as it maybe could be. So let's look at this, um, uh, this video here. Um, we can still run that today. Um, it's, it's about eight minutes and it gives you an overview of the uh, Ubiquitous Computing Project.
All right. So a couple of things to, to just take away from the video here um, for you. Um, you've seen the park devices, where they are is crucial to perception. Um, knowing the room it's in, you know, can make a computer adapt to a lot of things without any AI, just knowing where you are, for example. Um, and we've seen that um, the park folks uh, were thinking of these inch, foot, and yard scale devices with hundreds, dozens, or just one or two of them per room. Uh, the park tab uh, was actually uh, prototyped and uh, a couple of them deployed in 93. Um, in the in the paper, he uh, they talk about how one of those tabs being much smaller than, of course, would actually be something you would attach just to every book's spine so that you could find a book again uh, later on if you misplaced it. It's kind of like an activated post-it notes. You know, it can can basically help you find missing things um, or as a voting tool in, in meetings, etc. You can use it as an active badge to identify yourself or or to identify an object that is attached to. You can use it to shrink windows from a whiteboard session down onto your tab, not to look at them there, but just to carry them with you and then bring them back to your own office and, and look at them there on your, on your computer or your own whiteboard. Um, and this, this is a great example of a research uh, product, right? The park tab was not supposed to be a product you really use in, in normal offices, but it was a prototype that assumed constant connectivity, right? It just, you know, by creating some infrared links and stuff at the time here, um, they just created an environment that felt like you were constantly connected. And they said, if that one day becomes possible in the average office, then this is the kind of interaction we want to have. So um, would you say tabs exist today? What do you think, Jasper? Looking at you, kind of undecided. Yeah, kind of. Uh, the interconnectivity isn't that kind uh it isn't given like that because you have multiple devices which are on their own uh perfectly fine mm -hmm. but you don't really connect like uh shown in the video right um so technically i think you know almost always on is is has become a reality um uh we can certainly do uh you know the job like tiles for example that you can i mean literally i have a tile on my on my in, in my wallet so that when I look from a wallet I can just you know basically ping it um, so that that is available but what's still missing is this um, you know easy sharing and moving content between these devices and also um, a key distinction is that their devices were all meant to be shared and not really belong to anybody uh, unless you make them your own as a wearer um, where as we always think about personal devices uh, the pad was uh, it's funny when you listen to them, they actually are honest. They, they say like, okay, um, this it's kind of like an over a crossover from a paper piece of paper and a laptop. Um, and it looks like an iPad, right? You know, you would say, well, the park, um, the M tab that they, they invented the pad there uh, is literally just the iPad. Um, and I think that's true, right? They say it's got the power of a workstation, but in a car, you know, carry with you kind of form factor with pen input. That's exactly what you can do with a modern iPad pro. Um, but the one difference is they said, this is like a scrap computer. You walk into an office or like a meeting room and there's just gonna lie a dozen of these on the table for you to pick up and use and fill with your content, move your content onto and then take it with you again, right? Um, in a way, the, 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 their vision was, you know, the antidote to the window based environment. You know, who wants a desk that's back in those days uh, is on a single screen, the whole desktop is just nine by 11 inches, right? Or even 20 inches or 30 inches. You actually want your real physical desktop and you want to put these tabs, uh, sorry, these pads out there to show you lots of content next to each other to be able to look at five papers at the same time, for example. So again, augmenting the physical space rather than putting everything into the virtual space as we tend to do. Um, yeah, I talked about what's missing with the, with the iPad. Um, and then there's the board, right? It's uh, used as a video screen, as a bulletin board to, to basically actually adjust to who, who is looking at it. So when a visitor walks by, it will show different content than when an engineer walks by from a group. Um, but it's also a whiteboard just to sketch stuff on, right? And uh, like a flip chart you draw on. And, and it becomes clear, and that's what they talk about in, in, their, in their writing, is that the, they need a very different UI, right? Because keyboard input is awkward when you're standing in front of a whiteboard. Um, a menu bar is very hard to reach. You can't just put a uh, standard um, UI on this. You need a different user interface metaphor for these kinds of things. 
Um, in, in this case, they also talk about how they share this thing, possibly even across, you know, large distances. So um, to, to wrap up, what we're learning with Ubicomp um, versus, you know, the PC or virtual reality, Ubicomp really assumes that the computer disappears, right? Um, it's much more similar to augmented reality that we know today. Um, and they also termed the, the, the coined the term of calm computing, computing that moves the technology out of your, out of your face, right? The goal is more to really activate the world and, and putting computers into everything that you have around yourself, rather than putting everything virtually into the computer and put you into the computer. Um, uh, Mark Weiser considers the PC just a transition towards what computing is really uh, able to do, uh, which will then hopefully see folks much more on the human needs and human environments. Um, even carrying, you know, even carrying a very strong laptop is 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 like, as he put it, just owning one very important book. Right? He wants to be able to um, really, cust you know, to to have millions of them around um, won't help unless you actually have something that releases um, this this personal connection. Um, when Mark Weiser was looking at what multimedia was doing in the uh, 90s, uh, it seemed to make the machines even more attention grabbing, right? With blinking um, advertisement or, or, or you know, animated uh, effects on the desktop that was more attention grabbing, that was not making the machines disappear. So this is really a contra, uh, a counter trend to the, uh, to the multimedia trend in a way. Um, there are some um, uh, interesting psychological uh, uh, or philosophical, maybe you could say, but you know, also cognitive psychology based uh, things. When you use a hammer and you hammer in a nail, you don't think about the hammer, right? You think about the board you're nailing to the wall or you think about the house you're building until the hammer breaks. When the hammer starts feeling a little jiggly, like the, like the head is gonna fly off, you're gonna become very can conscious of your hammer all of a sudden. The tool moves right into the front of your conscious uh, thinking and you're like carefully hammering to that you don't, you know, you know, the tool doesn't break. Um, so when technology works really well, that's when it can disappear. Or um, you know, psychologists talk about compiling, not compiling in the computer science sense, but compiling in the sense that a person using a tool like a pencil or even something more complex, if it works really well, compiles it and uses it without thinking about it consciously. So what I want to make sure you understand is that Ubicomp is very different from VR, right? VR lets you reach unreachable worlds um, like the inside of a human cell, but it tries to simulate everything, the infinite variety of reality, um, instead of taking the infinite variety of reality, the richness of it, and augmenting it with additional information, which personally I find, um, I find more interesting. Um, some of the predictions that the Ubicom paper makes um, is, uh, or the, the research made, that displays are going to get smaller, CPUs are going to get faster, all that happened. Uh, the battery uh, predictions that they made were actually a bit too optimistic. They assumed that they would get, you know, days and days of use out of a, 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 an iPad-sized device. Um, that unfortunately didn't quite happen yet. Um, and the memory, um, de you know, development was actually underestimated from, from their papers. Um, the high resolution walls they were imagining that go over like endless meters on your wall and that have tens of megapixels also haven't quite become reality, although we're beginning to move towards that with 4K displays um, and 8K displays. Um, but the biggest differences are really um, more conceptual. Today's operating systems really still assume that you pretty much have a fixed hardware configuration. Um, they don't assume, like a whiteboard doesn't just assume that tabs join in and, and that it links to them and that it finds them and that it can talk to them while they come and go all the time. That really still takes some uh, specific middleware uh, in between the OS and the applications. You know, your window system typically assumes that it's running on one fixed base computer and not just being this distributed thing like a session in a meeting room, for example. Um, and the diversity of input devices that Ubicomp expects isn't really being dealt with very well just, just yet. Um, we do have networking, of course, that's much better than what they were able to do back then. Um, but, you know, um, multiple connections are still uh, a struggle with some of these techniques like, like BLD, for example.
So um, last slide on Ubicomp here. Um, Ubicomp became a, a, a workshop and a regular conference series in the 90s, and it's been going on ever, ever since until today. Um, tabs, pads, and boards are mostly commercially technically available, but often they still fling to the desktop metaphor and they're not plentiful, as in there's just a bunch of them in a room and you pick one up and you use it and you leave it. Um, it is to me one of the most intriguing visions of the future for, for human computer interaction and computer science in general. Um, I like the, the term that Mark Weiser coined, where he said, like, he wants computing to be as calm as a, a walk in the woods. You know, there's lots of things to, to notice in, a, in the woods, but it's not driving you crazy and making you stressed. Instead, it relaxes you. So um, that's maybe something that um, could be happening in computing more. All right, we're done for today. These are the next steps. Um, we have uh, some uh, suggestions. The Designing Interactions book by Bill Mogridge is an enjoyable toffee table book that, again, I recommend you just get your uh, get on your Christmas um, uh, wish list from your, from your family. Um, it's a really beautiful book with lots of insightful articles on, on HCI. Um, we have the computer for the 20... You don't need to read the entire book, right? That's just... Um, just something to, uh, to take um, a look at. Uh, the Computer for the 21st Century and the Starfire Video Prototype Project are short papers I'd like you to read. And the Buxton Collection is just a pointer that I wanted to give you um, on these input devices. I think we mentioned it last time during the class. Uh, we took a look at that. Uh, it's an interesting resource to browse if you've got, um, got, got a few minutes to spare. All right, with that, we're done with the sort of history and uh, visions of the near future look at HCI. Um, thanks everybody for joining and we'll see you again next time. We'll stick around for a few minutes um, in case anybody has any questions. Um, other, if you don't, then uh, just log out. This content was provided by RWTH Aachen University.